Hello, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, it's a great privilege to be a Gresham professor of anything, um, but I'm particularly pleased to be the Gresham professor of psychiatry, and I'm very glad to see so many people um, have come to uh, hear some words that I have to say about the nature of violence. So I'm going to be thinking in this particular, this first lecture, about violence in a more general way, um, in the next lecture, I'm going to be talking more about the people who commit acts of violence. And in my last lecture, I'll be talking about treatment and what we can do about people who are violent. So I need to acknowledge some of the people who have really helped me in this work, um, and then particularly my colleagues at Ravenswood House. Ravenswood House is a medium-secure unit for people with mental illnesses who've been violent. Broadmoor Hospital, for those of you who don't know, is a maximum security hospital for people who've been violent. Um, my colleague, uh, Professor Jim Gilligan in New York and Yale, um, and Anthony Perry and the estate of the late Evie Williams for letting me use some of their beautiful pictures. What I want to do in this uh, inaugural lecture is to think a little bit about whether violence is normal and to think a little bit about how we understand violence generally, using, it, using the figures that there are. And I'm going to focus most of my talk about homicide, because that's the violence that I've really spent most of my working life looking at. There are different forms of homicide, and I'm going to talk about that, but overall I'm going to suggest to you that violence is a complex form of communication, that it's not a simple behaviour in any sense, and that we need to think about an ecology of violence, that different levels and layers of meaning and how they influence how violent offence occur. And I'm going to end perhaps with some thoughts about violence prevention, which I'm going to take up much later on in the third lecture. But I guess this lecture needs to start with a warning, and I guess I can't do better than to ask Shakespeare to warn you for me because I am going to be talking about carnal, bloody and unnatural acts. I'm going to be talking about the perpetration of violence. I'm going to be talking about things that are disturbing. And I'm not going to necessarily be talking very much about how suffering is relieved, but very much about how and where violence comes about. So I think it's only fair that I should warn you. Because this is the sort of thing that when we think about violence, this is what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about the deliberate infliction of fear and pain on vulnerable people. And I think it's holding that idea in mind is part of what, of course, intrigues people about violence. It brings people like yourselves out to lectures like this, but also, I think, appalls us uh, as well and frightens us. And so it's easy, I think, when we're with subjects that are frightening and appalling, to you know sometimes to find thinking is difficult and sometimes to to be very pushed towards easy solutions or simple explanations. So one of the things that's worth thinking about, I think, first, is about whether violence is normal. And one of the things people often say uh, to me is that you know, violence is completely normal for human beings. And one of the, the best evidence for that is that violence is very common, that all over the world there are very high rates of, of violence, and especially homicide and suicide. I'm not going to say very much about suicide because, of course, that's a self-directed violence is really a whole topic in its own right. But I think it's, you know, it's worth thinking about the very high levels of violence that there are, and especially the different rates in different countries. And this is not a particularly good slide, but this is just a reminder that actually homicide rates are not the same everywhere. In case you needed any persuading, there are places in the world where homicide is really quite rare, and there are other places where homicide is almost a daily occurrence. And I think that that's the first bit of evidence that should make us pause a little bit when thinking that violence is essentially normal and expectable for human beings. Now, this is an appalling slide, um, and I don't want you to focus on anything at all particularly, except on the, blue, the red and green boxes, because the red and green boxes are, the, are about uh, homicide and suicide. So this is a, uh, a slide showing the leading causes of death in the United States in 2012. Um, and again, all the white boxes are various types of diseases, and I wouldn't worry about those too much, unless, unless you've got any of these diseases, which I'm very sorry. But um, 
but in fact, what I was really just wanting, and wanting us to focus on are the red and the green boxes. And first, and the green boxes are suicide, and the red boxes are homicide. The blue boxes are unintentional injury. And one of the things that you might like to think about, particularly the epidemiologists among you, is how much sense it makes to put homicide and unintentional injury together when you're putting, looking at the statistics. There are, very, there, are very, uh, there are very comprehensive statistics that are available that will tell you about the high rates of homicide and unintentional violence. Um, but I think one of the things that we might want to think about is whether it's really helpful uh, to put those things together. The other thing that's worth noticing is just how in the different age groups, homicide takes place um, in different, affects different age groups and suicide similarly. That suicide is something that is uh, pretty much unknown before the age of 10, but homicide sadly seems to occur very, in, in children and the under 15s and then again in younger, in younger, in younger people and then stops pretty much once you get to the age of, magical age of 40, which is a great relief for all of us who are 40 plus. So this is the, another slide, again, looking at the different types of violence-related deaths. And again, the green boxes are suicide, suicidal deaths. And you'll notice straight away is that there's many, many more uh, suicides um, and then, homo than homicides but that the homicides are mainly uh, by firearms and various, types of, and various types of stabbing or cutting <coughs> or piercing. So I think, again, it's just worth noticing how it's not uniform, that homicide is not a uniform activity across all the different age ranges. Um, and it seems to be something that t it seems to be an event that can take place particularly, um, particularly amongst the young, in fact, and that, again, I think is worth thinking about when we think about both perpetrators and victims of homicide. I won't spend very much time talking about victims today, but um, the victims of homicide tend to be very similar to the perpetrators of homicide, um, and they tend to be young men. This is a slide just showing us, in case we um, didn't know, um, which is that the rather peculiar thing has been happening, which is about the rate of that violence rates appear to be decreasing. And this is about the rates per 100,000. And this is for the last, since, since for the last 20 odd years. And basically, the rates of violence seem to have been falling, particularly uh, for young men, for some time. Interestingly, not <coughs> nearly such a great drop for women. Now, of course, the, the fascinating question and the big, the big Nobel Prize winning question is why are so many more men violent than women? Um, and that's not something I'm going to be talking about in this particular lecture, although I think we might well spend a bit on time in it next time. But I think what's very striking is that the rates of violence amongst women, women have not changed very much in 20 years. They're low, um, and they, but they haven't dropped a great deal, whereas the rates for, for young men seem to have you know, really changed uh, quite dramatically. And this is just another one comparing young people, 10 to 24, with all ages. And again, apart from a sort of blip around 2000, pretty much across the age range, rates of violence have been falling. Um, and this is from the United States, but it's fairly similar in this country too. But you'll see that the rates, of course, of violence <coughs> amongst the young are considerably higher than the general population. And it's very much the young who get involved in violence that are, say, that are both perpetrators and also uh, victims. And here's yet another slide, but this is just, again, about separating out males and females. And it's really just, uh, to somewhat labour the point, perhaps, that it's by no means clear that rates of violence are static, that are universal, that don't, ch that don't change. Clearly, there's an effect somehow something's been changing in rates of violence over the last 20 years in, pl in places like the USA and in Europe. Generally speaking, where there's stable governments, there seems to have been rates, falling rates of violence. But there's, all, there's important influences of age and important influences of gender. And again, this is just to make the point about gender, and it is a real puzzle. Um, John Monaghan, um, who's a professor of uh, forensic psychiatry in the States, 
did a piece of work in which he was looking across cultures. It's about 20 years old now, but it's still good science, I think, and found that there was no culture in the world where men did not account for 80% of violence perpetrators. So there's something very odd going on, I think, about the Y chromosome in terms of its influence on violence. Because clearly, not all men are violent, far from it but the vast majority of men will never be violent. And yet when it comes to significant violence perpetration, it seems as though men, are, and particularly young men, are much more ready to act violently. You'll notice, however, that there's not such a huge difference in the 10 to 14 age group. And there is some reason to think that, um, that in the te amongst teenagers that boys and girls are beginning to equalise a little bit um, in, relation, uh, in relation to violence. But it is quite striking, I think, that, men, that young men and young women are really are, are different. Um, I won't go into that in great detail. Again, just to, to look at the differences between, between these two. Um, sorry, that's a repeat of the last one. This is the one I wanted to, to look at too because this is about um, ethnicity. Because I think one in, in the States, certainly, there's a big influence of ethnicity in terms of perpetration of, of violence. So here you see really uh, big differences between um, the use of knives and, and sharp weapons, cutting or stabbing type of weapon, knives and guns, in the different, type, in the different ethnic groups. Now, I, don't, I wasn't able to find similar data for England and Wales, but I'm sure... It does exist, probably buried deep in the Office of National Statistics. Um, but I think what's important here, again, when we're just challenging the idea that violence is normal and that everybody's at it in the right circumstances, I think we need to consider this effect both of age and of gender and clearly, I think, of ethnicity. And this is another, just showing the preponderance of, of firearms. And, of course, many people have speculated that the huge rates of violence, and particularly um, homicide in the States, which really mark it out from other similar uh, jurisdictions, is the, uh, ac the access to, to firearms. <coughs> this is a, an interesting uh, slide, um, and quite what its significance is, is anybody's guess. Um, but um, you know, anybody, again, the statisticians amongst you will know that there is, uh, that correlation is not causation. But it is interesting to speculate on what, the, um, on what the connections might be between spending on science, space and technology and increasing rates of suicide. Um, and this is really partly a warning about statistics. Uh, this slide, I think, and just should remind us that we need to be careful about um, uh, you know, lovely figures like this that look as though they're very significant but may actually miss out some very important intervening variable that we don't yet understand. But I think it is significant to look at the, the increasing rates of suicide because I think that they have not changed so much. And there is a very interesting debate um, amongst people who work with violence perpetrators about the relationship between, uh, between homicide and suicide. Rates of suicide amongst violence perpetrators are considerably higher than the general population and rates of suicide in prisons generally are, are, are higher. So you know, there have been speculation that there is something about that capacity for destruction um, that links suicide and homicide. This is one of the uh, pictures by Evie Williams um, and is, I think, a, a very beautiful uh, picture and just reminding me to talk a little bit about groups um, now of, uh, of homicides. And I was, be, I was helped in this analysis by looking at the UN study of global homicide. Because in theirs, and this is a paper that was published a couple of years ago, which, looks, um, which has looked at homicide across the globe. And what they've done very interestingly in their analysis of homicide, um, again, and across you know, um, over 100 different countries, was to conclude that there are three different motivational groups when it comes to homicide. That homicides are not all the same. And again, I come back come to my starting point, where if violence is not all the same, that violence is not normal, that violence is perhaps much more complicated, once we start to look at it 
in more detail. And what the uh, UN Global Study of Homicide suggests is that violence, that homicide in this particular group, that homicide has different meanings in communications, that it's sending a message to somebody. And they break homicide down into three different groups, criminal and relational and socio-political. And the criminal group are those people who are killing really in order to, in the furtherance of crime, so that's particularly in relation to gang-related violence, but also um, crime that relies on dominance hierarchies, where people are killing in order to maintain their authority and dominance. Relational homicide is that homicide that involves people who've known each other, and um, many people here will probably already know that the vast majority of homicides take place between people who've had some sort of close relationship, that homicide is an offence that nearly always involves some, uh, some sort of relationship or past relationship between the perpetrator and the victim. Homicides of strangers are, are, are really comparatively rare. And then the last group, uh, the group perhaps that we're, we're perhaps particularly familiar with at the moment, which is the socio-political terrorist group. And, and the UNIDOC group have, a, I thought, a rather chilling phrase to describe this group, who say that they're killing people for what they represent. And I think that that's an interesting way of thinking about homicide. Again, the, different, the point being that the meanings and communication behind the homicide are really very different. And here, they've broken it down in a, 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 into a bit more detail. So on the left, we have the homicide related to other criminal activities. So either related to organized crime or homicide that's carried out in the perpetration of crime. Interpersonal homicide, again, perpetrated by an intimate partner, family violence, or related to some type of interpersonal stressor. And then the last group, which is related to various forms of prejudice and political agendas. And I guess what I take away from this, particularly in the world that I work in, is that it becomes very important then to analyse a homicide in terms of its message and its meaning. That actually spending time really trying to understand how a homicide has taken place and what the message is, is a crucial part of the work that I do, certainly, with that very particular group of people who are violent, uh, that a group, a group, a very unusual group, is a group of people with mental illnesses who have been violent. Um, and I'll say some more uh, about that in my next lecture. But, but very much a lot of the work that I do, particularly as a therapist, is about trying to work with people who have been violent to understand what the meaning of their violence is. And crucially, to try and discover whether they feel they've got their meaning across. Has the meaning been communicated? Is the job done? Um, becomes a crucial question, I think, in relation uh, to particularly into homicide. And these are the different groups um, by, different, by different types of countries. Um, and this is from... So this is really demonstrating that in different countries you get different proportions of the different homicides. So the blue group are the, are the sort of socio-political terrorism group. The red group are the criminal group. Um, and, the, um, and the beige group are the interpersonal violence. And the key message here, really is that different types of homicide take place in different proportions in different countries. That it's by no means, that violence perpetrators are by no means homogeneous, that there's different types of activity going on here. And in the Americas, of course, you've got a lot of gun crime. Here in Asia, much more uh, terrorist or political. Um, but globally, pretty much of an even spread, with interpersonal homicide accounting for 24%. And you either think that's good news or bad news, depending on your perspective. But I think that interpersonal homicide is the one, of course, that we've been perhaps most con uh, concerned about in the, world that I, in the world that I work in. This is also just reminding us again about the importance of different types of weaponry and access to weapons, which makes such a difference, I think, in the perpetration of violence. This is my colleague Jim Gilligan, um, who works um, in New York um, and has been working in the psychology of violence for 20 years, and some of you may be familiar with his work. He's published widely on the subject of violence, and he uh, in particular has worked with violent men and been studying the, how much the role of shame 
in the genesis of, of severe violence. But Jim's most important work over the last few years with his colleague uh, Bandy Lee in Yale has been to look at different rates of, of violence by political structure. So, and this date, this is from his, this is from his book, Why Some Politicians Are More Dangerous Than Others. And if you haven't read it, I urge you to go out and buy a copy because it really is the most fascinating read. And what Jim and his group have done is to analyse the uh, death rates in the USA, both homicide and suicide, um, in terms of the political government, governments um, that were in charge at the time. Um, for those of you who can see, it's a bit hard to see, but in fact, um, they are blue, um, obviously, for Democrats um, and red um, for Republicans. Um, and the take-home message um, is that, um, that here we see these are the Republicans here and the Democrats here, and again, Republicans around here. Um, and basically, what Jim has been able to show is that there tends to be a very significant rise in homicides and suicides when the Republicans in power, um, and a drop in homicides and suicides when the Democrats are in power. Uh, this has not made Jim popular um, <laughs> um, in, in, with all political groups in the States. Um, I'll leave you to work out which parties he gets invited to and which parties he doesn't get invited to. Um, uh, there is equivalent data, uh, is equivalent UK data, um, but it's not nearly so remarkable, partly because our base rates for homicide are so much lower. Um, and the, um, and the, the, the inequalities um, the, and the cha change of government are not so dramatic. Um, but this is really just to put, the next step is really just to, to show that the rates of homicide are so very different across the different states. And that this also maps onto political flavor. Um, and that these with these, the, you can see here that these dark colors here are mainly in the southern states. There are some pockets, of course, up here, but there are a lot are in the southern states, and particularly here, this is uh, Texas. Um, and that what Jim's hypothesis has been is that, that, these, um, that the rates of suicide and homicide change according to political structures which favor inequality and, and particular competition. That governments that favor and support intense competition between people are governments that therefore tend to suggest that those who lose those competitions are not worthy, are less successful. And if you combine that with cultural groups around, particularly cultural ideas about masculinity, where a man must always be successful, what Jim and his group have suggested is that where you get governments in power that support intense competition and inequality, what you tend to get is a whole group of men who are desperate, who are ashamed, who don't feel like men when they lose their jobs and can't get work, and that these are men who are perhaps particularly at risk of, 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 act, of acting violently. We do have a little bit of data from, um, from this country. And the, I mean, Jim, Jim's work is based also, uh, this is from the um, Equality Trust um, Foundation. Um, but there's, you know, there have been several studies that show very nicely that where you get big, big inequalities of income, across a social spectrum, you get increased rates um, of violence. And that's again, is just to make the point that I've been trying to labor, if you like, that there's nothing necessarily natural about violence, and particularly not about homicide. That actually homicide is influenced by the relationships that we have with people, by the culture that we're living in, by the degree of inequality in our society, by the attitudes towards masculinity um, and, um, and the theme of and the, the question of your age and indeed the gender role in terms of uh, shame and masculinity. This is a study um, by Bartels and Pizarro um, from, a, again, a couple of years ago, which looked at the uh, at utilitarian reasoning in different groups of people. And they found that they compared... Uh, people who scored high on psychopathy measurements. Now, again, 
the epidemiologists amongst you will want to say that self-reported scales of psychopathy are probably not all that reliable, that uh, the really good-going psychopaths don't admit it on self-report scales. Um, and I'll be talking a little bit about that next time too. Um, but in this particular study, what was interesting about it was that not only was the people who score highly on psychopathy don't seem to do very different types of moral reasoning from other people. So it may be difficult to distinguish your psychopath from your non-psychopath in terms of their moral reasoning. And that might be quite important when it comes to choosing governments. And I say that with May in mind. The other thing about it is that in this particular study is that they were looking at the use of utilitarian reasoning. And what Bartos and Pizarro found um, was that psychopathy seemed to be associated with the degree to which you use very, you know, very straightforward, crude utilitarian reasoning. If you use very crude cost-benefit analysis, what's going to benefit me most? What's going to benefit my group most? That type of reasoning seemed to have rather a strong relationship with people who scored highly on psychopathy. Again, I don't suppose that Bartels and Pizarro get asked out to many parties either. Um, but it's interesting um, to think about what we might mean by utilitarian reasoning and about the issues about costs um, and how we put value on what things cost. Um, some of you will have had the privilege of hearing Michael Sandel speak on this issue about moving from a situation where we think about, mar about market economies to market societies, where we put value on things in terms of how much they cost. Um, and there is a risk, I think, that, you t that a very crude, very crude types of utilitarian reasoning are used quite widely to make judgments about cost. Lest you should think that violence is the province of... Uh, people who are strange and sort of mad, gun-wielding drug, drug dealers in Caracas. Um, they're not all mad, drug-dealing wielders in Caracas. Um, violence can be perpetrated by nice people like us. And this is a memorial to the 508 patients at Reichenau Hospital who were murdered by the medical staff who were looking after them at the time. Um, they were murdered um, uh, in the 1930s as part of the euthanasia program. Um, and that those murders were carried out by very highly educated middle class people who were not drunk and not wielding guns um, and not growing up in a culture which supported violence. Uh, but nevertheless, um, they were, these patients were murdered by the people who were looking after them. And I think that any account of violence needs to think very carefully about these different types of examples. Any theory of violence and it needs to be able to include these different types of problem, this different, this counts of structural violence and violence that occurs in very unexpected ways. Again, we might think here of the influence of a political structure which facilitated the murder of really very vulnerable people. Uh, this is a very uh, complicated slide, but this is one of the reasons that I, I like it. Um, and uh, I won't attempt to take you through it, partly because I don't really understand it myself. Um, but um, what it sets out to do, and it's a wonderful title, The, the Bazaar of Violence in Iraq. That is a great title uh, for a slide. But what this is attempting to do is to try and analyse all the different elements that go into understanding violence in Iraq. Then this is, a, this is very much a contemporary slide. And I think if one takes nothing else away from this very complicated slide, is just how complicated it is to understand the human violence in this particular cultural group. So that again, the claim that violence is normal for humans, that it's very straightforward, that everybody's violent, um, and what else can you expect? I think that a detailed analysis of both the statistics but also in looking at the relationships between different groups of violent people, I think tells us that actually it's intensely complicated to try and make sense of violence. So here, this group are just pointing out the differences between car bombings, between mortar attacks, between kidnappings, assassinations, assaults on contractors, and things that make that more likely. Infrastructure disruption, corporate departures, government instability, and here, and other things, declining media coverage, desensitisation of the audience, 
military insensitivity to losses. These are all factors that are affecting the commission of violence in Iraq, to take one place as an example. And again, it seems to me that this is a beautiful example of an argument for the complexity of human violence and the necessity to parse any analysis down um, and look very carefully, making sure that we're not missing important variables. Uh, some of you may know this gentleman. Um, this is Vince Gilligan. And again, some of the 10% of the audience will go, yay, and the other 10 will say, who? And Vince Gilligan devised Breaking Bad. Um, and for those of you who haven't seen Breaking Bad, Breaking Bad is a story about a man who becomes violent. Um, and the reason that I put up this picture of uh, Vince Gilligan is because Breaking Bad is a beautiful description, really, of how one man changes from being a very ordinary man into being a very violent man. Um, and I can't recommend it too much if you haven't, if you haven't seen it. A little bit of Busman's Holiday for me, but not too much. So, and the reason that I, I, I emphasise this is because I think when we're thinking about violence... We, we're, I'm, I'm, you'll notice that I'm moving from the governmental to the particular individual. And I think when we're trying to analyse violence, we need to keep these different perspectives in our minds, if possible, simultaneously. And the reason that I have this picture of a bicycle lock is because I think to understand serious acts of violence, we need to be, look, we need to be thinking about them as acts that are multiply determined, that there are many factors operating simultaneously and that some factors will be very easy to spot. And there'll be things like cultural norms, the government of power, male gender, substance misuse, a massive risk factor for violence, which actually doesn't appear in the statistics, um, but actually is a massive contributor uh, to violence. Um, but then the last number in the lock may be something quite idiosyncratic to the violence perpetrator. And that's something that we see very much um, in the work that I do as a therapist with people who are violent, is often looking for that last number. So what we're thinking about here, what I'm encouraging us to think about, is a sense of an ecological model of violence. That the idea that we would move from the individual, the microsystem, to the macrosystem. That we'll be thinking about influences on violence that are coming, as it were, at, you know, from the, ind the individual risk factors but also interacting with the social and cultural risk factors. So that each act of violence has to be analysed with these different levels, in, different levels in mind, that we don't collapse, as it were, too early for, for, sim for simple examples. And I want to now move just to think about some violent individuals. Um, and this, I want to talk now about some young, about violent young men. And this is a, a, going, I'm going to talk about a study in Florida um, and these are the unhappy young men who were the uh, study um, here. And this was looking at the degree of adverse childhood experience that these young men had experienced. So um, this, the, the methodology for the study is based on some very interesting work that's been going on for about 20 years now by a group called the Kaiser Permanente Health Management Organization, who are a big HMO in the States. And about 20 years ago, they decided they wanted to try and understand why some people were very heavy users of their services. And what they did was to take a sample of 17,000 of the men and women who use their services, and they asked them about their early childhoods and about the degree of adversity they'd suffered. And what they discovered was that there were very high levels of childhood adversity amongst the people who were most frequent attenders at the health management organisation, who were most frequent users of services. And this is really, and this is a, a slide which just shows you the difference. So the blue bars are the Kaiser Permanente group. So you can see that quite a lot of people had no ad childhood adversity at all. Although interestingly, you know, 35, only 35% 35 of people had no childhood adversity, which is quite interesting if you think about it. And then this group of people had just had one type of childhood adversity. And, I'm, and if you want to know what we're talking about, we're talking about divorce, we're talking about poverty, <coughs> we're talking about uh, physical types of abuse, we're talking about serious violence within the home, those sorts of, uh, of disadvantage, you know, any things that you would think of as disadvantageous. 
Here we are with these. About the same groups had two. But here are the juvenile offenders in, um, in the Florida prison. And 50% of them had had four or more different types of childhood adversity, considerably more than, than, the, gen than the general population in the Kaiser Permanente group. That is a considerable number and, of course, very different. Compare this bar with these people. Almost hardly any of the offenders had had no childhood adversity at all. And I flag this up because, again, if we're thinking from the top down about the governmental influence on inequality and utilitarian reasoning and the bottom up from individual vulnerabilities, then somehow but all points in between we need to be thinking about violence risk. And this is just another study showing something that's showing rather similar. But if I just show you now really what the, the adverse, the way that the method, the way that adverse child experience might impact, um, and what the current best guess that we have at present is that childhood adversity of these various types has a big influence on the development of neural pathways, particularly in the frontal lobes. And the, front, the frontal executive um, is part of the brain um, that was, we know is most involved in terms of our sense of agency and our sense of choice and our sense of responsibility and indeed our, our social brain. Um, and I will be saying a bit more about that when we next meet. But what we think, of course, is that if you have that type of early neuron disruption of neurodevelopment in your first five years or so, then that has an impact on your social, emotional, and cognitive impairment because you're going to go into school with difficulties. And if you can't get into school and stay in school, that's going to seriously disadvantage you. But also, this is a group of people who then adopt health risk behaviours, particularly smoking and drinking and illicit drug use. And that then leads to disease and disability and social problems. And it's very clear that the more childhood adversity you have in early life, the more likely you are to die early as well. And that fits in very much with what we know about violence perpetrators, which is not only are they socially isolated, which is a risk factor for early death, but they tend to die, they tend to die early. And these are the types of childhood experience we're talking about. We're talking about abuse. Um, people tend, very understandably, perhaps to focus on sexual abuse, uh, but sexual abuse is comparatively rare. Much more common is physical abuse and neglect. Um, and neglect is a significant problem uh, which are, um, because of its effect on neuronal development. Household dysfunction, mental illness in the family, an incarcerated relative, mother treated violently, substance misuse in the family, and divorce. <coughs> and this is a uh, picture comparing the development of the, of the brain um, these, again, the picture on the left depicts a fairly healthy brain. Um, the picture on the right is a, well, is a Romanian orphan who was institu institutionalised shortly after birth um, and uh, it suffered extreme deprivation in infancy. And, it's, of course, it's interesting, the Romanian orphan uh, studies, which some of you will know, carried out by Professor Sir Michael Rutter, um, found, of course, that many of those orphans were actually getting food and drink and were warm and had, and, and had uh, shelter and so forth. But what they didn't have was any emotional input. They were neglected uh, to a, a fairly, very significant degree. And if they were not rescued before the age of two, this was a group of children who had very significant neurodevelopmental impairments. Um, and they suffer from significant cognitive and emotional problems. But they particularly around the area of the front of the temporal lobes um, regulating uh, sensations um, and a very important part of the neural connections between the frontal lobes and the memory, part of the brain that regulates memory, and the bit of the brain that regulates fear. Um, so damage like this is going to be a significant problem, lead to significant problems in mood and affect regulation, particularly being able to regulate your anger and your fear is going to be jolly difficult for people with this type of brain. And here's a raw, even more extreme uh, picture. This is a, a very sad picture uh, comparing, just this is a straight uh, CT um, scan showing the difference um, in size and shape. 
um, between um, two, two children. Um, and the Harvard Center for the Developing Child reckons that neglect is one of the most toxic things that you can do to a developing brain. And that's important, I think, because in terms of that many of the, if we look at the adverse child experience, I've already seen the Florida offenders, but 40%, at least 40% of the violent offenders that we hold in our prisons have been in care. And now the care system may not be all that great, but you've got to think, of course, about why they were in care. And of course, one of the reasons that they were in care is almost certainly because they were abused and neglected. So again, if we're putting together somebody who's vulnerable in terms of adverse childhood experience, and we put them in a social structure where there's massive inequality, where there's access to weapons, where there are different types of identity for a homicide perpetrator, whether in relation to crime or to terrorism or to interpersonal relationships, what you've got is a meeting of risk factors that should worry us, that should worry us a lot. Um, and then this is really just a, a, another slide about the, about the risk factors. Um, this is really about poor health. And the reason I put this here really is just to remind me to say that, again, those people who perpetrate violence tend to have very poor, poor physical health. And we're only really just getting on top of this. But I think what's fascinating is just the massive impact of childhood reversing on your physical health. Um, and the risk factors for poor health. So these are some of the questions that I think that we are left with, which is that if every act of violence is complex and multiply determined, if we're thinking about violence as a type of bicycle lock with a number of risk numbers that have to be activated, why are levels of violence falling? Why do levels of violence change? in relation to political structures. Why is violence different for the different genders? Is it about gender role? Is there something about the Y chromosome that's uniquely uh, vulnerable or, va or, leading, or somehow leading to acting as a variable for violence risk? We need, it seems to me, to be thinking systemically from the individual to the social in what I think of as this ecology of violence. And I think that it's at this point that I'd like to stop and invite your questions. And thank you very much for listening.